A pleasant evening to everyone. Good evening to those who are joining us online as well. It's one thing to say that it's hard to sing the songs because there is nothing that appears on the screen, right? Like tonight, we don't read anything on the screen. But it's another when there are letters or words that appear on the screen and yet you don't recognize the words that are printed there or that are written there because the characters are unfamiliar. So that's another story. Something that is there and yet you cannot recognize it or you don't recognize it. Now there is similar to that that took place in the very life of Jesus. He was there. The miracles he performed were so obvious. The power he displayed was so vivid. People, some of the individuals, especially the marginalized individuals, recognize his power. They recognize his authority. They recognize who he really was. But there were some individuals who were expected to recognize him, failed to recognize him. Oh, by the way, we have decided to continue with our series entitled, When God Asks Questions. Supposedly, the sermon last Sunday was the last of the series, but we decided to continue it within the month of July because there are a lot of instances in the Bible. Now we will be looking at a New Testament passage wherein Jesus asked a question toward the blind man. And so let us look at this account that we will be discussing tonight from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 18 up to verse 38. Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 18 up to verse 38. From the New American Standard Bible, 1995 edition, the Word of the Lord says, While he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will get well. But Jesus, returning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. At once the woman was made well. When Jesus came into the official's house and saw the flute players and a crowd in noisy disorder, he said, Live, for the girl has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. This news spread throughout all that land. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him. And Jesus said to them, take note of this. This is the question that we will be discussing this evening. Do you believe that I am able to do this? I'll repeat the question of Jesus. Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout all that land. As they were going out, a mute demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed and were saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, He cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. May the good Lord bless the reading of His word. As I told you earlier, in this account of the book of Matthew, Jesus obviously displayed His power by performing miracles. He displayed his authority and he displayed his ability. These two should go together. If there is only one that is possessed by a person 
only authority but does not have the ability, then we will have a problem. Because if the person has the authority, he is expected to do according to what he is called, his position, his particular task, his job. If he is given such an authority, he is expected to perform according to it. Just like, for example, when you are a professor and you will apply for a teaching job in a university, the school would make sure that they will be able to really not just scan, but study thoroughly your curriculum vitae. And if they could have you the chance to really teach in front of them, they will do that. Why? They are making sure that before they give the authority to you to teach, the, they will be able to see well if you have the ability to teach. Because if you are given the authority to teach and you don't have the ability, then that's going to create a problem. These two should go together. Some people, they have the ability, and yet if you don't have the authority, you cannot exercise that ability that you have. Like for example, if you are a good singer, you have a good voice, you work well with the notes, you can play and sing well, I mean, with the other instruments, you're a good singer. And yet, if you are not given the authority to come here and lead, then you will not be able to exercise your ability. So the two should always go together. It shouldn't be authority only. It shouldn't be ability only. The both should be present. In the very life of Jesus, in his ministry, these two were present, obviously. In fact, if you look at the context within these two chapters, 8 and 9, Matthew presented some details here in this manner. He presented three miracles. He talked about discipleship. He presented three miracles and talked about discipleship. And then talked about three to four miracles again. I mean four miracles in the last part of chapter 9. So, I want us to take note of those miracles that Matthew related. Going back to chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, you would see there that Jesus was approached by a leper. And the leper approached him and said, Lord, if you are willing, Lord, if you are willing, I want us to take note with the word Lord. The word Lord assumes that this leper acknowledges the authority of Jesus over him. If you call someone Lord, there is an understanding behind your brain that that person has the authority over your life. Other than the respect itself, there is a recognition of the authority of the person. That is why when we call Jesus Lord Jesus Christ, when we address him that way, never forget that you are stating something that acknowledges the authority of Christ over your life. And so the leper said, Lord, if you are willing, heal me. The line, if you are willing, assumes that Jesus has the ability. Because if that doesn't assume that Jesus has the ability to heal, the statement should be, if you can, please heal me. But the statement is, if you are willing, it assumes the idea that the leper understood that Jesus had the ability to grant him the healing. So these two go together, the acknowledgement of Jesus' authority and the acknowledgement of Jesus' ability to heal. Move forward to the following chapter. There are several miracles that also would show to us the presence of these two. Now we'll proceed to chapter 9. When you look at chapter 9, it starts with another miraculous incident. What happened here is this. There was a man who cannot walk. And when he was presented to Jesus, Jesus said something like this, Your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders who heard that statement, they really, they cannot accept that statement. Because in their head, they were thinking, only God has the authority to forgive. If Jesus is saying, I forgive your sins, or he declares, your sins are forgiven, he was putting himself on that level of a deity. 
And thus the religious leaders were looking at him and they could not recognize him as a deity. That is why they wrestled in their hearts and minds. How can this guy say these words? It's a blasphemy. So they couldn't accept it. But Jesus, in the way he said it, he is actually declaring his authority. Knowing what the religious leaders were thinking, Jesus said, Why are you thinking that way? Which one is easier to do? To release forgiveness or to say to this man, get up and walk? And so he did. He told the crippled one, stand up, pick up your mat or pick up your bed and go home. And the person stood up. It shows the ability of Jesus to grant strength on the legs of that person who was not able to walk for years. So the presence of the idea of his authority was there. The presence of the idea about his ability was there. Both were present. We'll move forward to the section that we read. Same thing happened here. There were four miracles, beginning with verse 18, that Jesus performed. What happened this time was this. He was approached by a synagogue official. And a person told him, Jesus... My daughter just died. She is lifeless now. But you know what? If you will touch him, if you will lay your hands upon her, she will come back to life. What a faith that this guy had. And so Jesus, hearing this man, stood up. He started following him, and the rest of the disciples also stood up and started following this synagogue official. And while he was walking, there was a woman who touched the fringe of his clothes. Because this woman was thinking, if I am only able to touch the clothes of Jesus, I will receive healing. And these two stories are, there is an intercalation here. They are like mixed together, something that is inserted in the line of the story of this synagogue official who asked for Jesus to come to his house and touch the dead body of his girl. There is an intercalation here because there was a woman who was inserted in the storyline. The woman exercised her faith that she was thinking, if I'm only able to touch the fringe of Jesus' clothes, I'll receive the healing. In the earlier part of it, when Jesus stood up, started following the synagogue official, the, the official exemplified a faith that Jesus has the authority even over death and has the ability to raise back the dead girl to life. So there is the presence of the idea of authority and ability. And the woman touched the body of Jesus. I mean, the, the clothes of Jesus. And Jesus looked at her and said, your faith has made you well. Or I'm granting healing to you because on account of your faith, and the woman instantaneously was healed. For 12 years, she was bleeding and she received the healing. It talks about Jesus' ability to heal. Move forward to the main story of the text for tonight. When that happened later, Jesus encountered two blind men. And these two blind men started following him and they were shouting at him. They were shouting this line. Have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us, son of David. Now, I want us to understand properly that statement because it's going to affect so much why Jesus asked that question. Do you believe that I am able to do this? They cried out to him, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, I shared to you before, in a very simple manner, we understand the word grace and mercy. They are different from each other. In a simpler manner, grace is something given to an individual that that person does not deserve. Or shall I say, something that is given even if the person doesn't deserve to receive it. Okay? On the other hand, Mercy is something that you deserve, a person deserves, and yet God takes it away or withholds it 
from that person. Grace is something you do not deserve but is given to you. Mercy is something you deserve, we deserve, and yet it is taken away from us or withhold from us. Okay? So you, you think of the difference. Now, the two blind men, it was common in their society back then that when you have a physical infirmity, if you have an ailment, if there is an issue physically with your body, if something is wrong with your life, they understood it as a consequence of the sins that you have committed in the past. Okay? So these two blind men, when they approached Jesus, they shouted, have mercy on us. What's mercy again? It is something you deserve, and yet it is taken away from you. These two blind men, when they cried out to Jesus, have mercy on us, they were actually telling, Lord, we have done something wrong in the past, and we acknowledge that our blindness in the present is a consequence of our mistake. Are you following me? In other words, they were saying, Lord, we deserve this condition. We deserve the blindness. But please take it away from us. That's mercy. They deserve that. They acknowledge that they deserve that condition as a consequence of their doing in the past. And yet they were crying out for mercy. And that caught the attention of Jesus. Why? Because in the way they address him, he was someone who has the authority to dispense mercy. If they have sinned, who was the offended party? It was God. And the fact that they asked Jesus for mercy, meaning to say they were acknowledging the deity of Christ right at that moment. And then they continued with the line, Have mercy on us, son of David. Don't you know that that line, it may be very common to us this time. Because we read in the Bible, we would see that line repeated several times. But during the New Testament time, that title was reserved to be addressed only to the Messiah who was waited for many years already. They were waiting for the Messiah for many years already. And these two blind men, they saw Jesus, not they saw Jesus, but they, they encountered Jesus and they, they said to him, son of David, meaning to say there is an acknowledgement that he is the Messiah that was present already by that moment in their midst. You see the theological framework behind the statement, have mercy on us, son of David. This may sound a very ordinary line, but it is packed with theological premises when they uttered this line. They knew Jesus. After this incident, they received the healing. And then Jesus encountered the demon-possessed person. Jesus granted the deliverance upon that person who was possessed. And then after that, after all these miracles that Jesus performed, the obvious example, I mean, the obvious exemplifying of the power and authority of Jesus. After all these things, the religious leaders, particularly the Pharisees, after he delivered the demon possessed, this is what they said. Look at verse 36. I mean, verse 34, the last part of it. But the Pharisees were saying, he cast out the demons by the ruler of demons. This is a very ironic statement. Because if you look at it, it can stand in contrast to the testimony of the blind men. This is very ironic in a sense that the two blind men physically couldn't see the two blind men does not have the ability of visual things, seeing the visual things around them and recognizing those things that are there in front of them. And yet they were able to recognize who Jesus was. You know, your eyesight is very important. 
Because it is the way for you to be able to identify black from white, green from blue, yellow from red. You could never say it's yellow unless you see it. Right? You can never identify a matter as circle. If it is distant from you, you could never say it's circle unless you see it. The blind man does not have the cap do not have the capability of seeing, and yet they recognize Jesus. On the other hand, the religious leaders, they can see with their naked eyes the miracles that Jesus performed, but at the end of the deliverance, they said, he delivered the demon by the power of the demon. That's ironic. They never recognize the authority and power of Christ. But here is something I have observed. If I, if I trace back all those miracles that Jesus performed, beginning with chapter 8 and even earlier than that, all throughout chapter 9, all of those miracles that he performed were all responses to the faith that the individuals had. And this gives us the idea that the person who has faith in his heart is the only person who can recognize the authority and ability of Jesus. Only those people who have faith. And I believe you have. You are here tonight. You come to church Sunday to Sunday, not only just to listen to music, you come to church not only to see other people around you and talk to them. But we come to church because there is faith, an element of faith in our hearts and minds. And that element of faith makes us recognize the authority and ability of the one who saved us. Why do we pray? Why do we come to God when we see around, things around us not falling into the places according to how we desire for them to be in? We do pray. Why? Because we acknowledge we have faith and we acknowledge the authority and ability of Jesus. When we have problems, we come to Him and expect Him to respond to us. Why do we do that? Because we have faith. And that faith makes us recognize the authority and ability of Jesus. And in all of those miracles, it was presented in different fields. Jesus performed and responded to the faith. Within the situation of healing, a person was ill, he healed the person. There was someone who was demon-possessed, he delivered the person. There were disciples who were struggling in the middle of the Sea of Galilee because there was a storm. Jesus came, performed a miracle because they believe in him also. So it was presented in different aspects of life, telling us that Jesus... In all of these aspects of life that we have, he has the authority and he has the ability. Many years ago, I was a student of Ebenezer Bible College and Seminary. And there was a room there, room number two in the men's dormitory. That was considered to be the spookiest of all the rooms. Room number two. Why? Because there were many occupants of that room in the past who testified about one thing. They had an experience of a spiritual battle that they called the black man. And after the four o'clock service, I had a chance to talk with Pastor John Ray Perez. It was only then that I, I heard him testify that he experienced it too. And so I, I became an occupant because every semester... We change rooms. We are assigned to another room. And that time, when we were in first year, we really didn't like to be assigned in that room number two because we know already the stories. Second year came, first semester. I read the list of the dorm occupants, and I saw my name written under room number two. And I said, Mauna Gyudne. I was scared already. And so, days have passed. We occupied the room. It was just fine. Okay lang. But one day, my two roommates left. I was left alone in the room. I wasn't thinking about it. 
Never thought of a black man. I was so tired from cleaning the CRs and cleaning the library. So I went back home in the afternoon and rested. I was able to sleep. More than an hour, around more than an hour later, I woke up because I felt someone was choking me. And when I opened my eyes, indeed, it was the black man seated on my stomach. And he was laughing at me while he was choking my neck. His eyes were red, and the side of his figure was smoky. It was like kind of smoke, black smoke and thing. And he was there with all the laughters that he had. He was on top of me. And I was trying to shout because I was scared already. But there was no sound that came out of my mouth. I wanted to punch him, but my hands couldn't move. Ingon pa nila, gidaman daw ko. But, after that incident, when I drove him away, never had I experienced a transition from a closed eyes to an open eyes. So to me, it was really real. For the rest of those people who experienced the same thing inside the dormitory, that was real. I was trying to shout, but there was no sound that came out of my mouth. I only remembered one thing. My Lord has the authority and has the ability to drive him away. And so I was saying, in the name of Jesus, by the authority of Jesus, by the ability and power of Jesus, go out of this room, stay away from me. But I couldn't say anything. I tried to move my hands, but there was a motion. As if I don't have the strength, I didn't have the control with my limbs. And I just kept on saying in my mind, in the name of Jesus, with the authority of Jesus, by the power of Jesus, I am commanding you to leave me right now. And as I continued saying that line in my brain, gradually, a small voice coming out of my mouth, gradually, a sound was produced through my lips. And by the time that I was able to speak already, straight before the presence of that spiritual figure, I said, in the name of Jesus, by the authority of Jesus, by the ability and power of my Lord, move away from me, stay away from me, and poof, like a bubble that is poke, he disappeared. And I was so tired. I was panting. My heart was beating fast. To me, it was very real. And never again that that black man visited me. I was scared, but I knew in my heart that the Lord who called me and brought me into that Bible school has the authority over demonic forces and has the ability to drive them away. I held to him. Even at that struggle, I held to the Lord and never let him go. This kept reminding me that incident that my God has the authority and has the ability. I do not know what you go through today. Maybe it's not a spiritual battle. Maybe you are struggling because you have children that are wayward, children that don't obey you. Jesus has the authority and the ability to intervene. Maybe you are struggling with your marriage. Always remember, Jesus has the authority and the ability to touch your family. Maybe you're struggling with finances. Always remember that. Jesus has the authority and the ability to address the issues that we have. We just have to follow what he tells us. Because at the end of the day, he is our Lord. We are his servants. Always take note. While we acknowledge his authority and ability, he remains to have the prerogative on how to respond to us. Because if we can dictate him with what we want, then at the end of the day, we are the boss and we are the Lord. So we tell him what we feel, we express to him our faith, but at the end of the day, live to him because he has the authority 
whether to act according to what we want, how we want it, or to act according to His desire and purpose for us. Live it that way. Because in every situation, He remains to be the Lord. He has the authority and He has the ability. And so whatever you go through in life today, always acknowledge that Jesus has the authority and the ability to address the issue. With that, I hope and pray that you will be encouraged all the more to stay with the Lord as the Lord stays with you and to always recognize the presence of Christ, unlike the Pharisees. Jesus was there obviously working, and yet they rejected his authority, and they misattributed his ability to the devil. Always recognize the presence of Christ, his authority, and at the same time, his ability to address any issue in life. God bless us all, and good evening.